We're going to be in Psalm 107 again this morning if you want to turn there. I want to read you the first three verses of the psalm, just like Pastor Jack and Pastor uh, Jeff did the last two weeks. We've been team teaching through Psalm 107. They both mentioned these first three verses. They're just such a great summary of the entire psalm, but also, um, let, let me read it to you, and then I'll make an observation about 107, 1 to 3. Out of the ESV, it says this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. I love that section of Scripture for a lot of reasons, but in in studying and thinking about it this past week in particular, I was struck by the fact that that is a picture of the church. That's the church. We give thanks to the Lord for He is good. We're gathered here together to give the Lord thanks because His steadfast love endures forever. We are the ones who testify that God has redeemed us. We are the ones who say so. And he has brought us from the east and the west and the north and the south, but he's also brought us from different ethnic backgrounds and different socioeconomic backgrounds, different, you know, experiences that we've had in our lives. And he brought us all into this one place and he calls us by his name. He calls us by the name of his son, Jesus, that we are Christ followers. We are Christians. And so I want to just pray this morning before we dive into the the richness of the section that I get out of Psalm 107 and just thank the Lord for each of you and for the opportunity that we have to be together. Um, I I say it regularly and I want to always say it with some frequency. Thank you so much for being a part of the Grace Church family. Whether you're visiting or you're here um, uh, all the time, this is home for you. It is a privilege and an honor that we have, those of us who are leading here at Grace, to be able to be a part of this family and serve you. So can we pray together? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word that endures forever. Thank you for your love that never fails. We pray this morning, Lord, as we dive into the scripture, as we dive into Psalm 107, this wonderful text that encourages us to be grateful. Lord, I pray that the the power of your word would transform something deep down inside of us. Lord, that we wouldn't just hear uh, teaching from a person, but that we would hear the teaching that comes from the teacher, the spirit of God himself right on our hearts this morning in Jesus' name. If you agree with that prayer, would you say amen? Amen. 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 Um, The the sections in Psalm 107, when Pastor Jeff and Jack and I got together, the sections that we broke up all start with the word some. If you look through Psalm 107, they're big chunks. Each section begins with the word some. And I have the confession to make this morning. Um, when we went through and we divvied up who was going to speak on which parts of the psalm, I took the best chunk. So I just want you to know I'm that kind of a person that would give other people less great sections, and then I kept the rich one for myself. It just happened to be later in the psalm, so I had a nice cover, but it is the best part of the, uh, of the psalm, in my opinion, and you'll see why once we get into it. But each section starts with the word some. You know, some people wandered in the desert, some people were in prison, some people were foolish. And then we get to the some people that I'm looking at, which starts in verse 23. So would you look down at verse 23 with me? 23 through 32 is my assigned portion. I'm going to read it to you out of the ESV. It'll be on the screen behind me. Some went down to the sea in ships doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. Verse 25, for he commanded and raised the stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to the heavens. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men, and they were at their wit's end. Verse 28. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Verse 31, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. The people that are in this section, like I said, they're, they're, they're different than the other sums. The other sums have issues, you know, foolishness or they're wandering in the desert or they're imprisoned for some, for some reason. These people kind of have it together. 
They, they, like, they have their act together. When you start reading this section in verse 23, they, some of them went down to the sea. They were doing business on the great waters. These are capable, self-assured people. They are, they're making things happen. They're earning some money. They are, they are um, not outright foolish. They're not in prison. They're, 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 they're um, resourceful. They are causing profit to be made. They're earning. They're capitalists. It's not, it's not an evil word to say. Like some people, is he allowed to say that here? Yes. They're just doing a good job. Like I say, they're making things happen. Would you turn to the person next to you and say, I admire people that can make things happen. We do. I mean, Americans do. We admire people that can make things. When I read this, that's what I see. This, these people have it together. They're, they're, I mean, they're fishermen maybe. Maybe they're shippers. I don't know exactly contextually what they were doing, but they were doing business on the water. And I want to I want to propose to you that they're not bad people. They're good people. They're they're self-assured people. They are they are um they're not bad, but they're probably a little distracted. That's the read that's the way I read this. They're probably a little distracted. Verse 24. They saw the deeds of the Lord as wondrous works in the deep. It's almost like, yeah, 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 it's nice scenery behind us as we go and make money as we go and do stuff, as we go and get things done. They remind me of what Jesus' brother James wrote in James chapter 4, where he said in verses 13 and 14, he said, come now you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. I think that's these people. They're just going about life, self-assured, doing the things that they know to do, using the waters as a place to make an income. Not necessarily bad, but somewhat distracted. Look what happens to him in 25. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind. So the Lord allows this storm to come into their lives. And they didn't realize that this, that what was coming next as they're doing business on the waters, what was coming next was a, not just a little storm, but a major storm, a storm that would raise them to the heights and take them down to the depths. And, and the waters that they had used to navigate and make profit are now not navigable. They're, they're unnavigable. They're terrified of the very thing that they used to use to get ahead. Their confidence is stripped. It says that their courage melts in verse 26. That in their evil plight, it says that they reel and they stagger like they're drunk because it's, the storm is so bad. They can't even stand up on the vessel because they're being kicked and whipped around in this storm. Their confidence is stripped away. They are fearful. They are without courage. They are unsteady. They can't even think straight, the text says, verse 27. They are at their wit's end. Would you raise your hand if you've ever been at your wit's end? Ah, wide agreement. I love that. Thank you. Yeah, we've been there. They are there. They're in the middle of this storm. They have no resource. They've got no plan. None of their experiences is helping them get out of this thing. They are in a bad way. They cannot change their own situation. Look what it says in verse 28. It says, Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Now, I want to I wanna posit something to you from the text, the way that the text unfolds. We start off with self-confident people who are just doing business, not doing anything bad. They're just making some money. The storm sweeps up, and it's so bad that they can't stand straight. They look like they're drunk, and they're at their wit's end. And then, verse 28, then they cry out to the Lord. I want to suggest to you that there's a delay between when the storm starts and when they pray. That would never be like any of us, right? Like what I think happens is they're doing business, something bad's happening. It's a little storm. No, it's a little bit bigger storm. No, it's a huge storm. And at some point in there, they're like, no, we got this. We're just gonna, we're just gonna muscle through. We're just gonna endure. We're just gonna push through this thing. We'll be fine. What is it called when you're on the front seat of the of the roller coaster and you grab hold of that bar? 
<laughs> scared, yes. We are white knuckling it. That's what I think they're like. We're going to get through this thing. And at some point, kind of like Jonah's story, at some point they're like, we ain't just going to get through this thing. And somebody has the wise idea, why don't we pray? <laughs> why don't we call out to the Lord? And they do in verse 28. They cry to the Lord and he delivers them from the storm. He delivers them from their distress. And I want you to see something. There is nothing in the text that says that God wants to punish them for their lack of quick response to the situation. Like the Lord doesn't say, well, I mean, if you'd have prayed right away, maybe I would have gotten involved. That's why it's so bad. You know, there's none of that. We do that. He doesn't do that. He's just waiting. Ah, that's the prayer I was waiting for. And he steps in and he calms the storm and he makes them glad. And they're okay. Everything is okay. The Lord hears them. The maker of the storm is also the calmer of the storms, which is a nice thought. And they had resigned themselves to destruction, to death. And now they're experiencing peace and calm. And they are glad that the waters are now placid. And it says in verse 30, I love this. It says that when everything was nice and quiet and they were at peace, it says the Lord led them or he, he brought them to their desired haven. So somebody in first service came up and told me something I didn't know. They said that's the only place in the entire Bible where that word shows up. That word haven shows up there. It's like this awful storm is taking place. And when they call out to the Lord, the Lord brings peace. He brings calm. And he says, okay, I want to take you to this harbor. I'm going to come back to that in just a few moments. And verses 31 and 32 is the refrain. If, if this was a song, all the Psalms are songs. This, these would be the choruses. It happens in verse 8 and verse 15 and verse 30, uh, 21 and in verse 31. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, his wondrous works for the children of men. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. I, I love that, that the way that the psalmist writes, it's an individual response. Let them thank the Lord, but it's also this corporate response. It's what we do when we come together. We focus our attention and worship on the one who is unchanging, who loves us, and we give him praise together. We do it in the congregation, and we do it in our, in our own lives individually. Sometimes we do it in our offices with our microphones on, but we do it individually and we worship the Lord and we worship him as a group also. Now, before we dig into kind of the application, what, what I'd like you to take away from this morning, I want to just say this, and I was, as I was uh, praying about this yesterday in particular, I want to just say this to you about storms, that regardless of what happens in our lives, I want you to know this morning from the heart of the Lord that everything that the Lord does in regard to you, everything that the Lord does in regards to you is motivated by love. Everything. Everything. And that is so different than the way that many of us have experienced life. And so it makes it hard for us to trust that God is actually that good. And I want to remind you this morning that he is actually that good. That he does nothing in your life, nothing in my life from an ill motive, from a dark or, or false motive. He is always, always, always motivated by love for you. Even when it's difficult, even when it is a storm, even, even when there's times of testing, which he does allow all of that is to draw our affection and draw our attention back to him. And so you, this morning, that may be the thing that you came to church, you came to grace this morning, that may be the thing that you needed to hear. And if that's the case, I just encourage you, write it down or in some way, hold on to that truth because the, one of the biggest things that the enemy does, his only real weapon that he has against us are lies and deceptions. And one of the biggest things that he does, one of the biggest lies that he tells is he says, you cannot trust the heart of God for you. He, it's what he said to Eve in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. God is holding out on you. There's something better. He's not letting you in on it. And as soon as we start to go down that road, all of life will fall apart. But if we will commit ourselves to trust in the goodness of God's heart towards us, we will be safe and we'll eventually find a haven. Hold on to that truth this morning. I think that's for some of us in particular. 
But overall, this passage, this is why it's a better passage than everybody else's. These, this, I get to talk about the storm, and the storm is a universal thing. Everybody, everybody experiences the storm. So the question I want to ask you right now is, why do you think these people, in verses 23 to 32, why are they so grateful? Well, pretty straightforward. They're grateful because they just got rescued. Write this down in your notes this morning. If you're taking the notes on the app or in the Grace Guide, the folks are thankful because they were rescued. They were in a really bad storm, and they tried to hold on and endure, and then they stepped out and prayed. They trusted the Lord, and they prayed, and he calmed everything down. And we know what that is like, right? Like, we know experientially you have a near miss with a car accident. Like, you ever been... I'm just going to pretend this, is, this has happened to others, but it has definitely happened to me where I was late for something and I was in the car and because I was late, I was trying to make time go backwards by driving faster. Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Like, if I just go fast enough, I'll be able to get there sooner. And I've done that and then did something really foolish, not paying attention while I was driving that way and thought afterward, like, man, I could have had an accident right there. And then all of a sudden, the thing that I was like trying to get to that was so important isn't that important because I'm thinking I could have died right then. You know that feeling? There's a sense of of relief, a a rush, the brain chemicals of euphoria come over us when when we're trying um, to to do something and we narrowly avoid catastrophe. Or there's a a storm that comes and it misses us and we're just like, oh, thank you, God. Or there's this near miss with a financial situation in our lives and we're like, oh, Lord, you're so good. That's the initial rescue. That's what these people are feeling. They're feeling that sense of relief from this initial rescue. They have, they have calm instead of calamity. They have peace instead of things just falling apart, instead of there being destruction. And that is a universal experience. People know what that feels like, that sense of relief, whether they follow God or not. Like when you go show up for jury duty and they don't pick your number. You're just like, oh, thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Anything like that. There's just these little things that happen. Everybody kind of appreciates that. We get rescued and we're grateful. But for the, the, the followers of Jesus, those who have a, a relationship with God that they are cultivating and digging deeper with, there's more for us in this text than just rescue. There's more for us than just, they called out to the Lord and the Lord calmed the sea. There's two things. Number one is this. Rescue is Temporary. Rescue is in the moment. But the thing that we can grab hold of out of this text that's deeper than just the rescue of the moment is hope for the future. After the storm, rescued people who remember what God did for them have hope for the next storm. They can always remember back to what he did in the past. Hope is more powerful than a one-time rescue. I've been there. I've been in that place where, God, if you just get me out of this, I'll serve you forever. He gets you out of it. I'm like, yeah, I'm distracted now. I'm going to go on again until the next storm comes and I pray the exact same prayer. But maturity, those of us that are really pressing in to know the Lord, we come out of those rescue situations and we are different people. And we are people that remember so that the next time things aren't going well and it looks like there's going to be a storm, we can say, he was faithful before. I know he will be faithful in the future. We hold on to hope. Because the next storm, literally or figuratively, is always coming. I don't want to say, say amen to that because that's kind of affirming a negative. But isn't that true? He heard us before and he will hear us again. Jot this down. Hope is the confidence that all will turn out well. Not because we control circumstances, but because we belong to the Lord over circumstances. That's what hope is. I do not know what happens tomorrow, nor do I need to know what happens tomorrow to trust that God will be there for me and bring me through. What a gift. Isn't that such a, an, an, a counter, a polar opposite of what we see people dealing with in the world who ride from one dramatic experience to the next, always reacting to the things that are happening without being able to say, my hope is found in nothing less and Jesus' blood and righteousness, that they're anchored there. We have that. That's deeper than just a rescue. And hope enables us to be able to constantly be grateful to God because the future is taken care of. Amen?
Turn to the person next to you and say, the future is taken care of. These sailing folks, these seafaring business people, also get another gift that's a little bit deeper than rescue. And I'm not, by the way, I'm not minimizing the importance of being rescued. We all need to be rescued. Amen. Yes. But hope is deeper. And the other thing is deeper. And it's back there in verse 30 again. They were very glad. They were glad when the waters were quiet and he brought them to their desired haven. He brought them to their desired haven. Another way of saying that is he brought them to a harbor. Another way of saying that is that he brought them home. The Lord directed those people to a place of safety, to a place of refuge, to a place of recovery, to a place of rest. Now, after we get rescued, I just love this, after we get rescued from whatever storm, yes, I want to have hope for the next storm, absolutely. But in the, in the, you know, in the meantime, I really just want a place to catch my breath. I want a place to be safe. I want a place to be covered and cared for. And that's exactly what God gives. Write this down. A haven is like a home. It is a place of safety and acceptance and love. And when I say home, I don't mean a house. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a few moments here, but I'm not talking about having a refuge of a physical structure. I'm talking about the relational network of people that are supporting us. And ideally, turn to the person next to you and say, ideally, ideally that would be in your own family, but it isn't always the case. Mercifully, God gives us another family called the church or even if we don't have that place of refuge, that haven, that harbor with our blood relatives, we have relatives that have been given to us, relatives that are blood by the blood of Jesus. And that creates for us a haven and a harbor as well. Having a home to go to, having a haven to go to is another reason to constantly be able to give thanks to God. Psalm 107, 23 to 32 is the story of all of humanity. And this may be discouraging or encouraging to you, depending on where you're at right now, but here's, here's my take on storms for people. And I don't mean physical storms, I mean all kinds of storms. In your life, you are either coming out of a storm, you are in the storm, or you are going into a storm. And I'm not trying to speak negative things over you or depress you in any way, but that's just kind of the way things roll. Things seem to be going along well. Like when people say to me, like, hey, things couldn't be better. Now, don't take this the wrong way, but I always think, well, that'll probably change. (laughs) Because it does. It does. We live in a fallen world. I'm not subject to all the things that are going on down here. I'm a child of the king of kings, but I'll tell you, I still live in the place that has fallen. The thing that we get to have, though, is an assurance of rescue, a community of people that support us, whether that's our blood family or our church family or both, and a hope that no matter what comes next, we're fine. It's all going to be good. I tell you, that causes you, it causes me to read the news differently. It causes me to be aware of what's happening in our government or what's happening in our world. Look at it totally differently when I recognize it's all going to be fine. And thank God it's not on me to figure it all out. You ever read the news and think, wow, what are we going to do with that? Nobody's asking me to figure it out, but I put that on myself like, here's what I would do. That's ridiculous. I just place it right there in the hands of the Lord and say, Lord, I trust you with this. You're going to make everything work out just fine. Every single person on this planet needs hope and needs a home. Every single person needs to know things are going to turn out okay. Every single person needs to know that there's a place of safety and acceptance and love for them within the community of God. And when we anchor ourselves as those who have hope and home, when we anchor ourselves there, the language of those places of hope and home, the language of those places is thanksgiving. We just give thanks to the Lord over and over and over again. And if you struggle, some of us do, um, and I struggle sometimes with this. If you struggle being grateful, 
These three things that are found in this section of Scripture are so helpful. Write this down. When, when we struggle with being grateful, we can always thank God for the previous rescues that we've experienced. We can always thank God for the home that we have right now, the haven, the place of safety that we're enjoying, and we can always thank Him that we have hope for the future. There's always the ability to be grateful for those things. I can always look back and say, thank you, Lord. I can always thank him for where I'm at right now, and I can thank him that the future is secure and assured. Regardless of what I don't have, I have hope and I have a home. And the same is true for you if you know Christ. And I would encourage you, we're going to pray together in here just a moment, pray a prayer of thanksgiving to the Lord. I want to encourage you not to get overly focused on thanking God for stuff. I'm not suggesting you not be grateful for the things that you have. Please, if you have things, thank the Lord for them. But if that's the thing that you focus on the most, you have to remember, I have to remember, those things can be taken away in an instant. You ever look online after one of these tornadoes rips through and they'll see a picture of some guy standing out in front of the place where his house used to be and he's just got what the clothes that he's wearing? I don't want to base my gratitude exclusively on the things that I can see and touch. I really want to base my gratitude. I really want my gratitude to flow out of the things that I can't see and that I can't touch. Things like grace and relationships and home and hope and on and on and on. Those are the places where I want to be anchored in my gratitude. I want us to pray together and take time, especially with Thanksgiving coming up, to focus our hearts in thanking the Lord for what he has poured out into our lives. And so would you stand with me? We're going to do that right now. And you're going to be standing for about five or six minutes, so be forewarned. If you're thinking, man, he's going on, we're going to do two things as I have you standing, so it's on purpose. But I want us to start by just thinking about ourselves, thinking about what we have been given, not just the physical things, not just the stuff things, but the bigger and deeper and more important things that we can't see. Things like rescue and hope and a home. Would you put yourself in that text because we've all been there, being okay and then really not being okay of a because of a storm and then being rescued out of the storm. Put yourself in that text and let's pray together. Father, thank you for the richness of your word. I thank you for this whole Psalm 107. It really is us, Lord. Whether we were wandering in deserts or in prisons of our own making or others' making, or just foolish or like these dear people in our section, Lord, self-confident and a little distracted. Thank you, Lord, that regardless of where we found ourselves, especially when we found ourselves in a storm, when we called out to you, you answered us. Your word is true. We can anchor our lives on the fact that you hear us when we call, that your motive for us is always good, always one of life, always one of restoration, and that you will bring us into a desired haven. And that regardless of what comes in the days ahead that we cannot yet see, we have the hope, an enduring hope, an anchor, and his name is Jesus, and we place everything in him. Lord, thank you for that. Father, I pray that, that, that thanksgiving and gratitude and appreciation would just overflow out of our lives all the time, but especially when our whole culture is focused on gratitude. Lord, may we be a people who are constantly seeing your hand give us things and give others things and take care of situations and circumstances. And so we're always saying, Lord, thank you for that. Lord, thank you for that. Lord, of all people on this earth, those who are your children, those who are Christ's followers, ought to be the most grateful, the most content, the most joyful, because we have a home in you and we have a future that is secure. Lord, may that be what we're known by. May that be our reputation as followers of Jesus. Lord, I pray that, that again, through this week and, and into the holiday season with Christmas and, and beyond, May your people be filled with gratitude by your grace. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
you know, for about uh, 10 months now at the front on each side of the platform, we've been uh, displaying these chalkboards that are just covered with hundreds of initials. And the reason that these have been up here, if you're newer, you don't know about the situation, what we're doing here, we, we, at the beginning of the year in January, we began to pray for people that didn't know Christ, that, that needed healing, that needed a deliverance of some kind. And um, we have, throughout the year, different times I've referenced them, we've prayed for them. I want to direct your attention to them again this morning. Because just as a way of update, there have been people that in January, when their initials were jotted on here, didn't know Christ, that know Christ now, which is super exciting. There are people that are up there that, that were, needed healing and they're walking and healing now that needed to be set free and they're, they've been set free. There's great things happening. But the reality is, is that's just a percentage, a small percentage actually of the numbers that are up here. And I want you to know a couple of things. One is we haven't forgotten about how important that is. And number two, I want us to pray for them this morning. And here's what I'd like us to pray. They need the Lord. They need healing. They need deliverance. They need something in some way to interact with the God who loves them. As we pray for them, I want us to also thank the Lord in advance for for answering the prayers that we're going to pray. Now, it works with the Lord. It doesn't work at your bank. Like you can't call your bank and say, I just want to thank you for the million dollar deposit you're going to drop in my checking account. I mean, by all means, if you want to try that, the bank will be open tomorrow morning at eight, call them. It doesn't work that way with the bank, but it works that way with a God who makes promises. Carrie mentioned it earlier. He's a promise keeping God. And when we say, Lord, your word says that you're not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. And so I'm praying for initials NC on this board. You're not dealing with a bank president. You're dealing with the the maker of the universe, the one that made NC when NC was two cells in a womb. And we approach him in that vein. So as we pray for them this morning, can we pray with a heart of gratitude for what we're asking to do? We're not paupers kind of coming to this, you know, king saying, Lord, if you could just give us some scraps to live off of. We are children approaching our Father who owns everything, saying, Lord, this is what we're asking for, and we know it aligns with your will for healing, for deliverance, and for salvation. So can we pray with that attitude, that spirit? Let's do that. Lord, thank you, Father, the maker of it all. The, the, as our sister said the other week, the, the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, who owns everything, who knows everything, who knows every one of these people represented by these initials and every circumstance that has kept them apart from you and in uh, need of healing and in need of deliverance. You know all of it. And so, Lord, we thank you in advance for reaching them and touching them and healing them and bringing them into relationship with you. We thank you in advance for being their deliverer, for being their healer, for being their savior, for being their redeemer, for being the Lord of every part of their lives. Lord, act. Show yourself strong. Your arm is not weak, the word says. Show your arm strong on behalf of these dear people. We thank you. Lord, they need a home and they need hope and they need rescue. Give those to them in the name of Jesus. We pray in faith. Amen. Amen. Please continue to keep praying for our friends that are there. Before I bless you, I want to just say, if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Christ, you don't know this Jesus that we're talking about, we would love to talk with you. We would love to pray with you. Our elders and some prayer team members will be up front after the service. Please don't be bashful. Don't be embarrassed. Come forward. Let us just talk with you and share how good God is. Amen. Would you extend your hands in front of you? I want to bless you in the name of the Lord before you leave this room. Grace Church family and friends and guests and visitors, may the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. May the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And whatever you do, friends, in word or in deed, I speak a blessing over you that you would do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus and that you would constantly give thanks to God through him. Receive this blessing and go in the power of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.